And our first speaker today is John Schiller. He's Deputy Chief of the Lab of Cellular Oncology, and he's an NIH Distinguished Investigator. He got his uh, PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle, and then he became a Senior Staff Fellow here at NCI in the 80s. And he's worked his way up. And this past year, he received a distinguished honor, the Lasker Award. So we're pleased to have him talk today. <laughs> HPV vaccines to prevent cervical cancer and other HPV associated diseases. John. Thanks. Turn this on. Okay, I hope you can hear me. And thanks especially to you guys who actually showed up here for this because it's so much easier because there's a few people to talk to. You just talk in cyberspace, it's always a little bit harder. So thanks to you guys for coming here. So on this first slide is, is outlined um, pretty much what we'll talk about today. So I'll tell you a little bit about the virus HPV, uh, the types of cancers it causes and how it causes those cancers. Then talk, then I'll switch to talking about the vaccine and talk a little bit about the composition of the vaccine, what it's made of, and then the vaccine efficacy in clinical trials and its effectiveness in national immunization programs. And then talk to you some about some of the key implementation issues that quite frankly, this is considered one of the, the major breakthroughs in cancer prevention in the last 20 years, but it ha it's far from reaching its full potential because of some of these implementation issues. And in the end, I'll get a little bit more mechanistic on you and tell you why this vaccine seems to work so well whereas other vaccines against sexually transmitted diseases, for instance, HIV, have been essentially miserable failures. So with that introduction, so the virus that we're talking about, HPV, and I've got the HPV-16 because it's the one that's most associated with cancers, are double-stranded DNA um, viruses. The genome is about 8 KB, and you can see it's divided into two regions. The, the early region, which has things that are involved in replication, um, transcription, and are also the genes that, that cause cancer, particularly this E6 and E7, which are selectively and retained in cancers. They're, they're two small proteins of 100 and 150 uh, amino acids. But I'll also be talking mainly about the, the major and minor virion proteins, particularly the major virion protein, L1, because it's what makes up the vaccine. Now the virion is composed, it's not enveloped, it doesn't have a, a lipid membrane around the outside, and it's composed of 72 pentamers of this major capsid protein L1 that form these beautiful star-shaped structures. It's about 60 nanometers across, and the second capsid protein called L2 is present in about 62 copies. In order to make infectious virus, you need both L1 and L2, and they encapsidate this AKB double-stranded DNA histone-bound genome. Now, the HPVs have very unusual life cycles because the only place they can make their virions is in a stratified squamous epithelia that terminally differentiates. And the virus is real tricky because what it does when it sets up infections, it tends to hang around for quite a while. And the reason it can do, it do that is it hides its major proteins from the immune response. And the way it does this is it initiates infection in these basal keratinocytes. I'll talk about this process a little bit more later, but it has to bind the basement membrane that separates the dermis from the epithelium. And then it gets in here and the genome replicates as a plasmid, but there's very low expression of the early proteins, E6 and E7, and no expression of the virion proteins, which I'll talk about later, being very immunogenic. It's only upon terminally differentiation where it's not under as high of immune surveillance, you get over-replication of the genome, high-level expression of the early proteins, and, and finally expression of the late proteins, which are the capsid proteins, the virion structural proteins, and assembly of the virions. And then the virions are released, either like in a common wart, just out into space, where they're not going to contact the immune system, or in case of mucosal infections, they're, they're basically released into the mucus where they can then come in contact with, with a partner and cause an infection. So this just shows you histologically what these type of lesions look like. So this is a cervical lesion, and by HPV-16, it's actually a very small 
almost an apparent lesion. If you put acetic acid on it, it turns a little bit white. But if you look at a protein that's associated with DNA replication, what's induced by one of these oncoproteins, E67, is called MCM. You can see in normal cells, it's just expressed in the basal layer of the epithelium. Whereas you get expression up in the upper levels because the, the virus is trying to induce the machinery for inducing DNA replication to replicate its own genome. And then some of these other proteins are only expressed, you can see, this is a viral protein only in the upper layers, not down here where the immune system would see them and, and cause a rejection. So, of course, the reason, the main reason we're interested in HPV is not because they cause warts, but because they cause cancer. And it's thought that approximately 5% of all cancers in humans are caused by HPV infections. And worldwide, overwhelmingly, it's dominated by cervical cancer about 500,000 cases and 270,000 deaths due to cervical cancer that's induced by HPV. And it's important to note that 70% are caused by one of just two types, HPV 16 and 18. Overall, there's about 10 or 12 types that are considered oncogenic out of the maybe 200 types that infect people. So it's really only a very small subset of the HPVs that are able to cause cancer. And if you look at these other types, they're actually dominated even more by E6 and E7, but the prevalence worldwide is actually quite a bit less. Now, if you look in countries like the United States or in Europe, the relative ratio of the HPV cancers change, and they're different for two reasons. One is we have pap screening, which reduces the incidence of cervical cancer by about 80%. We're still getting those types of infections, it's just that we, we remove by surgery the pre-malignant lesions so they don't go on to cancer. So the incidence of cervical cancer is considerably less. And secondly, there's been what's considered an epidemic of HPV positive oral pharyngeal cancer um, since the 80s, probably due to uh, changes in sexual activities, basically oral sex. And so that more and more of the HPV cancer burden is dominated by oral pharyngeal cancer. It's interesting to point out that, that the majority of these cases occur in men. About 70% of oral cancers occur in men, not in women, for reasons we don't entirely understand. Um, but suffice it to say, this gives a reason for men to take the vaccine, in addition to altruistic reasons, so that women don't get infected and get cervical cancer. Now, one of the, one of the main reasons that cervical cancer, if undetected, is the main cause of HPV-associated cancers is because of where the cancers tend to arise. They tend to arise at what's called the transformation, transformation zone, where you go from a stratified squamous epithelium to a simple columnar epithelia. And again, for reasons we don't entirely understand, almost all the cancers arise here. There's a lot of vaginal infections, probably as many as cervical infections, but, this, but the vaginal tract doesn't have a transformation zone, and so, the infections rarely go on to cancer. And the same is true for penile infections in men. Men get just as many infections as women. And they tend to be just as persistent, but they don't have a transformation zone, and so that it doesn't go on. Most anal cancers also occur in a transformation zone. Now, the two main genes that are associated with, with progression to cancer are called E6 and E7, and they're selectively retained and expressed during the process so that almost all cervical cancers will have these two genes continually expressed. And what happens, what these two genes do is E7 induces aberrant proliferation. Because again, the, the virus has this problem of it wants to, to, to replicate its genome, which is DNA, and it doesn't have enough machinery on its genome to, to, to replicate, to undergo the entire process. So it needs the cellular machinery, it needs a fool the, the system, the, 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 the cell into thinking it needs to replicate its own DNA. But in doing this, by inducing aberrant proliferation, this is a signal for apoptosis. And so it's got another protein, E6, that resists this urge to, in, to undergo apoptosis. And between these two together, you get immortalization, very strong genetic instability, and this leads to cellular transformation and eventually progression to cancer. So E6 and E7 are required but they're not sufficient to cause cancer. Cellular changes have to occur, which are driven by this, 
genetic instability that's driven by E6 and E7. And I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but both of these proteins interact with, with a number of key regulatory elements for proliferation and um, genetic, insta genetic stability. So E7, one of the primary things it does is by interacting with RB and RB type proteins and inactivating them, it activates e, E2F, which is a transcription factor that's required for, for um, initiation of DNA replication and entry into S phase. And E6 likewise interacts with a whole bunch of different proteins, PDDZ domain proteins, focal adhesion proteins, but most importantly, it interacts with P53, which is considered to be the guardian of the genome. And what it does is it interacts with P53 and induces its, its ubiquitin dependent degradation. It also interacts with components that, that activate um, H-TURT, and this again leads to immortalization because this activation of telomerase allows the cells to divide indefinitely without going into crisis. So in terms of the natural history in people, um, HPV infection is incredibly common in young people with lifetime incidence probably in excess of 80%. So that being HPV positive is almost synonymous with being sexually active. But the vast majority of these infections go away spontaneously through immune, immune mechanisms. So within a year or two, about 80 or 90% of these infections are gone, and you're probably now protected from reinfection. But what's the risk for cancer is this persistent infection, infection that persists for many years to decades. And you can see that precancer occurs at a decade or two later, and then real cancer two to three decades later. So there's a really a relatively long interval to intervene to prevent the, the process. And just to show you how rapidly people develop HPV infections, this is data from both the US and the UK. So it measures the time from the first um, initiation of sexual intercourse and the risk of getting one of these genital HPV infections. And you can see that in both in these two populations of young women that about half of them have an infection within two years. So this is one of the reasons why if you have a vaccine that prevents infection, you really need to, to vaccinate before sexual activity because afterwards you're running the risk that you'll already have, have the virus. Now we already have a way of preventing cervical cancer. I think many of you know, um, based upon the pap smear and more recently by identifying these HPV infections um, through DNA testing. But this is what's called secondary prevention because you already get the infection. And then if you get this abnormal cytology or test positive by HPV, it sets off this, this large algorithm where you get a codal colposcopy biopsy and if it's a precancerous lesion or a cancer, then you get a blade of therapy. And one can imagine that it makes a lot more sense to target the initial event, the virus infection. So if you prevent the virus infection, you, you can avoid all these.